the title for my message this morning comes from Philippians. There was a group of believers in Philippi, and Paul wrote to them. So, the, the title of my message is Finishing What You Start. And so I'm thinking, how many of us have this goal? So we started out. Have you arrived at your goals yet? I was wondering about that. So I remember looking back in my life in Kentucky when I was growing up on a farm there. There was a garage and there was a frame to, for a garage. But it wasn't completed, but the frame was up. But then it uh, stopped working and moved to California, left it there. It's still not completed. It's still sitting there in land in Kentucky. It hasn't been completed yet. It's The frame is still up. But that kind of reminds me of this message, you know, you should finish what you start. Putting the roof and everything up with that garage I was building. But instead I procrastinated and, um, you know, 13, 14 years pass already. So oftentimes when you start something, you're super motivated at first, but somehow that initial motivation kind of fades away. And you never reach this goal of completion. How many of you can say, like, I have arrived at my goal. I have completed what I set out to do. Only a few of you. So we're going to go over a few points and connect with this idea of finishing what you start. In Luke chapter 14, verse 30, Jesus is telling a story about a person who wants to start building, and then he says, this person began to build what wasn't able to finish. So that chunk is telling the story. But I'm not gonna be focusing on that story today. But it's like, oh yes, this person's like, I will do this, I will do that, but they never do it. <laughs> they, make, they say they're going to but they don't do it. A person's like, yes, I volunteer, but they don't actually get involved. A person goes, they start, and you know, we see this often with Christians. They like start building their life, but they don't finish following Christ. And this story over 2,000 years ago reflects that. In Ecclesiastes, um, there's a verse that says, uh, it's talking about in chapter 7, verse 8, it says, finishing is better than starting. So this idea of starting something, but finishing it, wow, that's better than just the start. The completion is better than the starting point. And then it says, patience is better than pride. My focus was on finishing is better than starting. And then in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, it's... Um, Paul is sharing his testimony. How God saved him and called him. And all this work that he's done, he's been traveling, he's been persecuted for Christ, he's gone through all these things. He almost died for Christ. He was beaten. He experienced a rough life. He was shipwrecked. He experienced really, really hard times. But then here in this verse, in, chapter, in verse 7, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, he said he's about getting ready to die. And, you know, he's saying his hellos, but he says, hey, I have fought a good fight. I have finished the race. I have remained faithful. I have remained faithful. So that's what Paul talks about there. So this whole thing is focused on what God's word has to say about finishing what you start. So God's called you to become a Christian, right? To become a follower of Jesus. You're saved. You're starting this new life. And now you need to continue it to completion. Don't stop. Continue to do it to completion. Um, Philippians chapter 1, verse 6 talks about this. I don't have this verse in here, but it says, God is the one who started the work, and he will be faithful to complete it until the day of our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. So that's a promise. 
my life, if God started this work, God is going to be faithful to complete the work that he's begun. So it's important that what you start, you need to finish. And I see many, many people not completing their walk with God. Um, for example, my office, you know, I have tons of papers stacked up in my office. Getting ready to set up a file cabinet. No, oh, I'm thinking I should do that, you know? It's, it, I'm thinking, you know, it would be more organized if I had all these papers in a file cabinet, I could find them easily. You know, also like I could have different colors, like red, green, you know, I could color coordinate things. So I would know what they were for, for different years. And I'm like thinking about this, I should do this, but I still haven't done it. It's been over 10 years and I still haven't done it. I have these stacks of papers and it's a little messy on my desk and I haven't completed this, but I need to just do it. I need to get this filed and cleaned up. And you know, when it's completed, you know, it's possible that I could pass away at any time and you know, you find all these papers and wouldn't it be nice for them to, you know, find a pastor's stuff all organized, but I'm like, no, I, I you know, if the IRS, if the IRS came, and they, it would be nice for them to find everything really organized. But um, going back to my message, the Christian's four goals. Um, Paul talks about the goals of a Christian and what the believer's goals should be. And they're really focused on finishing what you start. So the first goal is to know Christ intimately. Knowing Jesus, learning from him, studying about him. Theology. You know, the study of God. Who is God? Who is Christ? What are his characteristics? Who is he? We should study who God is to have a close relationship with God. Not just knowing about him, but knowing him intimately. Second, it's to experience resurrection power. This means that Jesus Christ rose from the dead and he had the victory. But without the, vis but without the resurrection, our faith is in vain. The gospel is worthless if Jesus Christ has not risen from the dead. The resurrection is critical in our understanding of the gospel. And for, thirdly, we need to die to ourselves, our desires, our pleasures. We have to deny ourselves. And instead, we're to fellowship with Christ in his sufferings, and we are to be conformed to his death. We are to be willing to go to the cross with him. Not what we want, but what Christ wants. And my fourth point is our goal should be to persevere to the end. And many, many Christians are quitting that fight. They start following and they give up. They're like, eh, I don't want to do this. But this reminds us, persevere to the end. So for example, if you're driving along in a city and there's maybe there's really heavy traffic, it's getting worse, um, you know, four, five, six, typically around the time, you know, driving around into certain areas can be really terrible, but you kind of go and you find back roads and you find the shortcuts. But even the shortcuts start to have more and more traffic as time passes on. And so, Walnut and Eastern and all these streets are just filling up. You know, you think, you know, maybe Eastern will be better. And then you go over there and um, you come to the end. And you end up having to go back. But the point is that God wants us to persevere to the end. Until we enter heaven. And we will go in reward with Christ Jesus. So basically, this is a basic understanding of this. These are our goals as Christians.
Additionally, we need to understand that there are three keys to finishing what we start. <clears throat> so we started something and now we want to complete it. <coughs> 30, 40 years ago, you know, time flies, they become old, and I'm realizing Wow, my time, my time for, you know, my days are limited. My days are numbered. The clock's winding down, you know? Time is flying by, and I realize, wow, okay, I've started this race, I've progressed. Sometimes there's been a stopping <coughs> point. Sometimes there's been a waste of time. Sometimes there's been a waste of skills. Sometimes I'm like, oh, I didn't use my skills appropriately. Sometimes you don't use your financial resources appropriately. We are not to stop, but we are to continue to do what's right. Like, for example, taking classes in college, um, learn the book of Matthew over and over again. One of my older teachers, a uh, hearing teacher, professor said, <coughs> he was in his 80s, and he's like, I'm still learning. I'm still in college. He was a retired pastor, but he was still teaching. And he said, I'm still learning about God from God's word. How many of you are stopping learning and just like, ugh, I'm bored with it. I'm done with God's word. I already, I already know enough about God. I can just take a step back. I know everything. No, I'm still learning every day. And each and every day I'm learning to be more and more humble. And I realize how much I lack in my own abilities. And so I had to continue, continue to study. And it never stops. Jesus Christ alone is eternal. So the first key, um, where you start, it's the first point is it's important to hold on to Jesus Christ, to rely on him. It's too bad for anyone who let those of him as it were. Remember the story of Peter. He was a follower of Jesus Christ for three years. He was with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ taught Peter, among other disciples, many, many things. Peter learned from Jesus. He saw Jesus walk on water, and he thought that was amazing, and he, he wanted to join, out, join Jesus by walking on water. And so he took up the challenge, and he walked out on water, Jesus Christ and Peter are the only two men to have ever walked on water. Jesus didn't sink, but Peter only walked on water for a short time, and then he, he sunk down into the water. Because he got distracted and noticed the problems and noticed the issue with what was going on with the ship. And he got focused on the storm, the problem, and he became fearful and panicky. And immediately he began to sink. And he cried out, help. And Jesus reached down and held on to him. So he was completely reliant on Jesus Christ. If he had dropped Jesus' hand and tried to make it on his own, he would have never, he would have drowned. Only by holding on to Jesus Christ could he have success. And in the same way, we do the same thing. We're going to go ahead and read in Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. So Paul wanted to continue to grow. Remember, he was a Pharisee. He was one of the religious leaders of his day. He graduated. He knew everything about the Old Testament, the books of the law. He knew them backwards and forwards. He was brilliant in studying the Old Testament law, but he realized he needed to grow more in God. He said, not that I have already obtained or have already reached perfection, 
Mm -mm. I'm not in a place of perfection. Instead, I press on so that I This idea of pressing on, I continue to go at it, I continue to go on with my life. I press on. I press on. He continues to move on. He continues, to, he doesn't just sit back and focus on his problems and focus on himself. No, he presses on, he goes on and continues on his way. It says, so that I may lay hold. For which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. So it's that idea of his hand being wrapped in Jesus' hand, and Jesus' hand being wrapped in Paul's hand. Paul saying, I press on. I hold I lay hold for the goal that I may lay hold. Sometimes there are financial difficulties in our lives. There are family difficulties. We're not to stop and we're not to, when our kids rebel, we are not, we are to press on, we are to hold on to God. We let go of God and try to focus on fixing all of these things. You will have a downward spiral in your life. Just like with Peter. We are to lay hold of Christ. So the Greek word is this idea of a very, very close relationship, like glue, like super glue. Basically like super glue, lay hold. It's this idea of like your fingers being glued together and it's really hard to get them apart if they accidentally get glued together. You have to be careful, you have to get them separated. When you use super glue, you have to be careful. So Jesus is saying, Paul saying, hey, I lay hold on Jesus Christ. And it's not just like holding on, but it's like the super glue are entwining their hands, basically. No matter what situations, hold on to Christ. Hold on to Jesus Christ. Press on holding on to Christ. You will arrive at the end of your trial. You will. But if you refuse to hold on, you will never finish what God's called you to do. So I know Paul was saying that he had not yet met the goal. He had not yet completed what it was that he had started. But when we look at these points, he says we, to know God, to know about everything, we know that God causes everything to work together for the good. For those who love God and are called according to what God's purpose are. We have no matter what is going on in our lives, what we are going through, we are to continue on. Through. Verse 29 says that for God knew his people well in advance. It wasn't like he didn't know what these people were going to do or how did this happen or whatever or geez, I'm sorry I made a mistake with you or I should have done something different. No. God knew his people. He knew what they were going to do. He knew the problems that would happen in their lives. He knew the things that would impact them as they were going through in their life. Because it's like a test. It says, for God knew his people in advance. He chose them to be like his son, to be conformed to Christ. Because he wanted them to be more like Christ. To be conformed to him, as Paul said at the beginning, that he had not yet been conformed. Because he knew that his son, this promise that he had, this goal, to be with Christ would be forever. His son would be the firstborn among many. So then we see also, in Galatians, we see my old self. The old life that one has had before. My life has been crucified with Christ, as if I were up there on the cross with him. 
It is no longer I who live or do the things for my own pleasure or do the things that I want, but Christ who lives in me, who lives inside of me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God. He who loved me and gave up his life for me. I mean, think of that as such an awesome thought. It's not us who live anymore. And remember how Christ died for us. He went to that cross and we are to hold firm to that, to that belief. And then when we look at Philippians chapter one, verse 20, Paul says, for I fully expect and look forward to and hope to be in heaven with Christ. He was constantly looking for it, no matter what was happening. You know, and often times too, you know, we think in our minds, you know, taking hold and going home or feeling that maybe we should stop. And remember, I mean, you could be in a car accident and boom, just like that, you'd be gone. And where, where are all those hours and those times that you were waiting for, waiting to do something? He says, I fully expect and hope that I will never be ashamed, but that I will continue to be bold for Christ as I have been in the past. And I trust that my life will bring honor to Christ. So whether I live or whether I die, for he says, for to me, living means living for Christ. So he's saying that he trusts God. He goes on, he witnesses in all the ministry that he did and in all the telling of the people about the gospel, telling them about Christ. He was still going to do that until his life was over. So this idea of continuing on, or pressing forward until you die, and he says, and then dying is even better because then you are taken up with Christ in great jubilation. On earth we have struggles. We, we constantly are struggling with sin. But when we die, everything is good. We don't have to stay on earth. It means that we don't have to be there. We are finished with our work. The goals that we have done, the ministries, the different things that we have done in serving and helping others, Christ will come for us. He will take us home. Home. So we have the first tenet of holding to Christ. The second one is forgetting those things which are behind. And when you look in this mirror, this rear view mirror, you see the elephant walking away. The elephants are pretty big and they plod along, but they're like the problems that we have. Instead of looking forward, we continue <coughs> to look back to the old life, to the old things. And there's a warning here that we are not to do that. We are not to look back. All of that is in the past. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 13, we'll see the significance and the meaning of this. Paul is saying, my dear brothers and sisters, I have not yet achieved it, but I am focusing on this one thing. One thing of not looking back of not dwelling on or obsessing about or thinking about all of these things in my past. I am to forget the past. You know, when you go back and you go back and you look and you think about it, you can't. You have to go ahead. Look forward, keep going. Don't look back. That is the warning. The problems that were done are done. Don't keep thinking about them over and over again. Move forward. Because you know that, you know, husbands and wives and things, and, you know, and then they will say, sometimes they'll say, you know, it's really important, you know, not to look back. You know, you're putting things away and you're marching towards a goal and you go outside and you want to, you're getting ready. If you turn around and you look back, what happens? that you stumble and then you worry about businesses and you know you worry about the energy and you worry you know all about what's happening in the air all of these things are done put them away everything in the past has 
it's like it's blown away and it's gone, like chaff in the wind. And it's over. And you don't want to be depressed about that. Think about the disappointments. There are people who keep going back and keep looking at these things and, and think, keep going back. Be done with it. Be done with it and move on to a forward goal. Press forward. Forget about the past, as Paul said. Look to see what's going to happen next. Move on with that. So forget what lies in the past and look forward to the future. And it says here, things that are behind and things that we should forget. Let's look at this. It says our past sins. You know, the things that you used to do, the horrible things that you used to do. You're the best. They're gone. Don't be looking back to the old ways. Finish with it. I remember, I remember you, I remember when we were in school, and I remember the years that we had, oh my gosh, and the things that we did. It's in the past. Put them back. Don't turn your eyes to the back. Look to the front. Because we need to forget our past sins. We need to forget the wrong that we have done back there. I mean, once you have repented of them, then you forget them. And then it's as if you sow seeds for a new life. But don't keep going back and be looking about them and thinking, oh my gosh, this caused such turmoil in my life or whatever. You know, when I, when I think back of my life and when I was at school, you know, and we, sometimes we tease these people, we'd bother them or whatever. We, you know, we weren't very nice to them and, and whatever. And I, I think of those things that I used to do then, 20, 30 years ago or whatever. And, you know, what I, sh I thought about what I should do and the things that I've done and all the struggles that that person has gone through. Sometimes they tell me that. You know, you meet someone and they say, I remember how you treated me back then. And you weren't really nice to me. And, you know, you were really awful. And I think of that, I think, wow, I'm really sorry I did that. But like our sins that are in the past, are done. Sow the seeds of a new life. Don't be thinking on something like, man, that guy did me wrong. I don't, I really don't like him. Put it in the past. Paul says to forget about it. You know, when things pop up and people keep referring back to the past and keep referring back to past sins that you've done, like if you meet somebody or, you know, somebody speaks of repenting of their sins and, and, and confessing them before God, to keep looking back at them and keep worrying about the forgiveness and the things that were done. That's a problem in itself, always looking back. We're not to do that. Once we have repented, we are to look forward. <laughs> you know, another thing that we are to do is to forget our past failures. Not to look back and think about all the times that all the mistakes that we made, and all the things that we did wrong. I think, why did I do that? Why did that happen to me? Don't look back to it. Don't dwell and obsess upon it. Put it away, it's done. Finish it. And then sometimes, too, we look back at our, the things that we did for our very own pleasure, the parties we went to, you know, the drinking we did, everything that we went on. Look back. Put all that thing in the past. It's gone. Done. You know, sometimes we have a discussion, you know, about different things and about the different pleasures that we used to have or whatever. And it's like, no. And you feel disappointed and you feel upset. But what we are to do is to move on to new life. Move on to bigger and better things. We'll have a new goal. A new life. A new life in Christ. You become a new person when you have a new life in Christ. So you put away those old things. And you have a new progress and a new way of going. But you know, a lot of people will say, you know, way in the back. I knew them in the past. I knew what they did back then. But we need to be finished with it because it's in the past. Forget about it. 
put it aside, make a new life. The problems of the past are done. Toss them out. Be finished with them. And then also unhappy experiences, things that have happened, things that you suffered with, terrible things. You know, maybe you were robbed, maybe somebody cheated you, maybe people molested you, maybe people bullied you. You can't think on these things. You have to stop it and be done. For many Christians, too, you know, who should be having a new life, they keep going to the past. They keep looking back at that. And I'm telling you now, get rid of it and be done. Move on. Progress on to a new life. Don't keep looking back. Don't keep remembering. You know, and say, well, it's burned in my brain. I'm never going to forget this. You know, he was so mean to me. And you know, that happens a lot. We see that happening a lot. But again, I tell you, we need to be done with it and to forget it. And then, too, when you look back, when you think how you failed others, promises you didn't keep, you know, the tumult and the chaos that you caused with people, maybe failed relationships with people, looking at all of these five things that we have just discussed, we must forget them, put them out of our minds. They're in the past. Now, I'll, just a little bit of extra um, explanation here about this, you know, about Paul's experience, and he's he wants to discuss with this, this his past life that he was putting it in the past, putting it behind him, really important. Now, Paul tells the people, he said, he said he once thought these things were valuable, and it says, now here in Philippians 3.5, it speaks about circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of Hebrews, knew the law. He was a Pharisee, well-versed in all of the teachings. You know, it's as if he had like a degree on his wall that showed how intelligent and just how distinguished a person that he was. These were the things that he considered valuable, that people knew him, that he had a reputation amongst people. You know, as if to say, oh, hey, you graduated with the greatest of honors. This is wonderful. High school, I mean, no? What if you went to high school or somebody did graduate from Gallaudet and looked down on them because they didn't? You know, maybe a certificate of graduation and you say, oh, you really moved on. You know, all of these things in life that happened in the past, it says here, Paul thought these things were valuable. But now he says, now I consider all of these things that he said down below about the circumcision and everything, he said, it's worthless. You know, as if to say, you know, that certificate, that graduation certificate with a little with a little tassel and a little ward on it and the whatever that shows just how smart you are. Just go to the trash can, open it up, dump it in. That's what you should do. You know, my family lineage of the tribe of Benjamin, this is how important I am. Wrap it up and put it in the trash. Throw it away. Put it out of your life. You know, the things that you had before, the things that you thought, this is from my past life, these are my experiences, these are these are, are what happened in my life. Put them aside. So if you read this in Philippians and you go all the way down, and you get down to verse 7 and verse 8. Paul said that all of these things that he considered so valuable, it was like dumb. You know, like cows, cow poop, when they, when they make great big messes and whatever, manure, or all of that. You know, again, just wrap it up and throw it in the trash. Get rid of it. Maybe, perhaps, Paul had, was disgusted and ill from all of these things. For when you become a Christian, 
I think my old life, I need to be tossing away these things, flush, flush down the toilet has to say, is gone forever. Throw it away. My past, toss it out. It's worthless. It's not going to help me at all. Now Paul wanted to reach for the future. He wanted to know Christ and experience the power that had raised Christ from the dead. He said, I want to be like him. I want to suffer him, suffer with him, and to share in his death so that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection of the dead. I want to have the same sufferings that Christ had. You know, people, people mocked him. People reviled him as he went through. People hated him. They were against Christ. They captured him. They tortured him. They whipped him. They crucified him. And Paul is saying, all of that, I want for myself as well. Because I want to be resurrected with Christ. And that was what Paul was reaching for, what he was looking for. So the first point of my message was holding fast to Jesus Christ. And the second is forgetting our past. And the third one is the upward call of God in Jesus Christ. So there's a continual call to be more and more like Christ. And Paul is like, I press on. I want to finish and be with Jesus Christ. We'll take a look here at what it says. Paul wrote, I press on toward the goal. You know, other translations say prize, but this word prize actually means Jesus Christ himself. Jesus is the prize. We are called to be in Christ Jesus. Being with Jesus Christ, bowing down and worshiping God, that will be the finish. That will be the end of the race. So there's this starting here on earth, but the goal is always looking towards heaven and meeting Jesus Christ. When he calls us, we will see him in heaven. That will be our eternal home. Philippians chapter 3 verse 14 explains a little bit more in depth. about looking forward to heaven, meeting and seeing, getting a new body, a glorified body with Jesus Christ, and being conformed to Christ. And there are different goals, and I'm not against having goals, like with your work, with your education, with your life, that's fine, but inside your heart, spiritually, do you have peace, like for example, Many goals, you know, a person wants to retire and have a lot of money for retirement, and then the time comes to retire, and they're like, you know, I get 4000 a month, I'm doing good, and it's like, hey, congrats to you. But a person sits at home, watching TV, getting that money every month. They just sit around. But they often feel empty. Hmm? Love your neighbor. What Jesus offers is free. This prize in Christ Jesus isn't something you have to earn for or work for. Financial comfort, all these things, hard times could come. But arriving in heaven, being glorified with Jesus Christ, wow, that's a far better gift. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God. Because of all he has done for you, let your body be a living and holy sacrifice. The kind that he will find acceptable. This is truly a way to worship him. And then in verse 2, it explains, hey, 
Don't be conformed to the customs of this world. The world's system, the world's, the world's goals for riches, all those things. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15 says the lust of the flesh. Talks about that. Being focused on ourselves, the pride of life. Don't be conformed to the customs of this world. So today we see many Christians that are copying the world. They are being conformed to the world. So God says, don't copy the behavior of the world. Uh-uh, don't do it. Don't follow them in their traditions. Instead, God wants you to be, but let God transform you into a new person. By changing the way you think, you're going to have new thoughts. Before your mind was set on this life, on your own things, on financial riches, whatever, all these different things. But instead, you're focused on heaven, and that's your goal. And God's going to change the way you think. And then you will learn to know God's will and what it is for you. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. God will show that to you. So don't copy the world. Instead, focus on heaven as your eternal home and follow what God says. Philippians chapter 3 verse 20 says, We are citizens of heaven. So most of you are U.S. citizens, right? Some are not yet citizens. But the good news is all of us are citizens of heaven. That's what we're focusing on. My citizenship is in heaven. Like being a U.S. citizen, this is just temporary. It doesn't matter. We are pilgrims and strangers traveling along the earth. So citizenship on this earth doesn't mean long. It's like you're in a waiting place getting ready to go on an airplane to take a journey. It's, the, it's this idea. We're just in a waiting place. That's what earth is. Where we do, earth is not our home. Heaven is my home. My citizenship is in heaven, and it waits for me. And when God calls me, he will take me there. It says we're, where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we eagerly wait for him to return as our Savior. Verse 21, he will take our weak, mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own, using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. So this means everything on the earth will be connected to Jesus Christ and will be brought under God's control. And so we're looking forward to that time. So my three key points on how to finish well, finishing what you start. In conclusion, we're going to talk about those just once again briefly, and there are many, many wrong goals that people have. They have a goal to become a nurse, and I'm like, oh, that's great, okay, there's, I want them to become a nurse. I want you know, them to have future work, teaching or interpreting, whatever, you know, whatever the goal that you have is, mechanics, building, you know, so many different goals. These are good goals to work, to earn a living, to earn our bread. And Paul says, um, you know, Paul was a tent maker. He sold tents and he sold them to people. But this is temporary to take care of ourselves, to help us live. But all of these things are reminders that it's all about Jesus Christ. It's all about him. And so maybe we have a purpose or goal of serving the Lord. And I want to applaud you. Keep doing that. that those goals are truly the most important so just in conclusion, in connection with finishing what you start, hold on to Jesus Christ, be held on by him. These three things are key for us this morning. The world's going to come and try to take us away and distract us with movies and all these different things. And sometimes our desire to serve God is going to dwindle. And that desire to glorify God might fade away. And it often happens in Christians' lives. And so we have to hold on. Wait a minute. The devil is trying to deceive me. We have to push aside those things. And instead, we need to remember how to serve God first. In Matthew, it says, seek first God's kingdom first. 
See, God's kingdom first. But many people make the world first. Yeah, heaven second. It should be the opposite. First is serving God, and God is going to add to us our needs for everyday life. In Hebrews chapter 11, chapter 12, verse 1, Many think that Paul wrote this book, but his name is not on the documents. But the Holy Spirit definitely moved with the book of Hebrews. It says, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. And chapter 11, actually, is the faith. It talks about the faith of Abraham. And Abel, it lists all these people who had great faith. They are the witnesses that this verse is talking about. And then it says, let us lay aside every weight this means the way the world has come to take us, the way sin has come to captivate us. We need to lay these things aside. We are to lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. We're so easily brought into bondage by the world, by, the, by all these things. It entraps us, it ensnares us. He's saying, let us lay aside those things and instead let us run with endurance, the race that is set before us. So you notice how it, and the Olympics is shortly coming up, and there's going to be a finish line, and people are going to be crossing that finish line. And so Paul is saying, we want to be like a racer in the Olympics, and we want to be running the race that's set before us. And then he, he gives us the key here. Don't forget to look unto the one who is best, looking unto Jesus. So it says that he is the author and the finisher of our faith. We need to look to Jesus. No one else. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. It's only Jesus Christ. Um, the Greek, another translation says, fixing your eyes upon Jesus. This idea, author and finisher of our faith. <coughs> author doesn't mean the person who wrote a book, but it means the initiator. The initiator, the starter, and the one that finishes. So you see how it, how it ties in. God started it, and he finishes it. He finishes, he starts our faith, and he finishes it. Who did the work? I have a new life. Who did that work? It was because of God. He saved us. Is finishing it? Who did it? Once again, Jesus Christ started it and finished it. He gives us a new life. He brings us out. He teaches us to follow him to the end. Who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross? despising the shame. He didn't consider that worthy. He didn't care about the shame of the cross. You know, sometimes people are like, you know, I graduated with a big, great degree, and it's like, so what? It's like, I earn this amount of money per hour. I earn $30 an hour. It doesn't care, it doesn't, those things are not significant. What matters is being with God. And if people mock us, we don't care about these things. Because God, Jesus, and then it said here, despising the shame, same, and he has sat, ha sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So we have the answer for our life. We're not to be distracted by the world and all these things in the world. But instead, we're to be focused on Jesus Christ. He is our target. It talks about the sin which easily snares us. And in the Old Testament, the King James translation talks about um, 
going somewhere and says, do not turn to the left or the right. There was a prophet that was told to go, and he was told not to speak to anyone. He was to go directly to a certain location. And when it was done, he was to go straight home. And there was an emphasis. Do not turn to the left hand or to the right hand. Go straight away and do what you've been commanded. And this is representative of looking, going straight to Jesus, looking straight to that cross. And the world is like to the right or to the left, but we are not to do that. But instead, we're not to look to the right or the left, as it were, spiritually, but we are to look only unto Jesus. Let's stand together now for our closing prayer. <coughs>